Good afternoon. I'm David Jacobson, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar series, School Community Partnerships for the Whole Child. We're really excited about this webinar series. It's been a pleasure working with our partners, the School Superintendents Association, the National Association of Elementary School Principals, the Council of Chief State School Officers, New America, and the National Association of Early Childhood State Specialists and State Departments of Education. A big thanks to all of them for their many contributions. And we'd also like to thank the New America Communications team for all of their support. Narmada, you can display the slides now. We have a great lineup of panelists to share their experiences. They're doing innovative work all over the country. They're going to be sharing strategies and ideas and advice that we hope will be helpful to you as you serve children and families, both during the pandemic, uh, but also as we transition out of the pandemic. We knew that either way the election went, there would be something of a reset in DC and that this is a moment in time to begin rethinking what a comprehensive approach to improving early childhood and elementary school education and care could look like. And we think that one of the best ways to inform that rethinking is to learn from the experiences of the communities that are at the leading edge of doing this work. A quick word about who I am. You can, uh, next slide, please, Normita. I work at the Education Development Center, EDC, a mission-driven nonprofit organization focused on improving education, health, and economic opportunity. A big part of our work is supporting early childhood and elementary school education and care. And my work focuses on the kinds of school community partnerships we're going to be discussing throughout the webinars. Now I'm going to briefly set the stage for our conversation today and over the next few weeks. And I'll begin by saying, next slide, please, uh, that I think we all have the conviction that in doing this work, our aim is to address the fundamental challenges of poverty and economic deprivation and the impact on young children's learning and development. 45% of US children under six live in low-income families. Low-income children are much less likely to graduate high school and college than their more affluent peers and the full achievement gap is present when children enter kindergarten. There is a consensus nationally among experts, among policymakers, and among the public that the best way to make significant gains in improving outcomes for children in low-income families is to start early. But it's also true that our early childhood systems are fragmented. Next slide, please. We have gaps between early childhood and our K-12 systems, gaps between education, health, and social services, and gaps between public and private programs. And these gaps constrain, they put limits on the potential of early childhood programs to eliminate opportunity gaps and achievement gaps. We know from decades of research that children need consistent quality each and every year of early childhood. Next slide, please. They need alignment across the age span so that each year intentionally and explicitly builds on the learning and care that took place the previous year. And they need for the education, health, and social services that they experience at each stage of development to be coordinated. Yet due to the fragmented nature of our programs and services, too often children experience inconsistent quality, next slide please, gaps across the age span, and a lack of coordination at each stage of development. So there are two movements underway across the United States to address this fragmentation. The first works to improve quality at each stage of development and improve alignment across the years. Next slide, please. We often call this pre-K to third or P3 or B3 birth through third grade. And the second, the second movement, next slide, please works to connect schools and early childhood centers to health and social services. This is often called integrated student supports and community schools and Head Start programs are good examples of these integrated approaches. So beginning in 2017, I received a grant from the Heising Simons Foundation in California to study communities that were combining these approaches. That is to say, they were designing local systems to improve quality across the years, to improve alignment and to improve comprehensive services. Next slide, please. These are some of the communities I focused on, several of which I'm really pleased to say are represented throughout this webinar series. And then we also have panelists from a wide range of other innovative communities as well. 
And what I found when I visited these communities is that they all began with a commitment to educational equity. Next slide, please. With a commitment to the idea that all children learn and thrive. The goal is to eliminate disparities by race, by income, and by other cultural factors. So that's the all children part. And by learn and thrive, we're talking about whole child development and learning including cognitive outcomes, social emotional outcomes, and health and mental health outcomes. And so All Children Learn and Thrive is one way to describe the twin themes of our webinar series, ensuring equity and whole child learning and development. In order to realize these goals, communities create partnerships. Next slide, please. Partnerships that include schools, families, and community organizations, including early childhood programs. These partnerships recognize the interdependence of schools, families, and communities, and the idea that through their collaboration, they can all be more successful. So what do these partnerships do? I found that they implement three broad strategies which they tailor to meet local needs. Uh, next slide, please. I found first that they bring professionals together to collaborate on teaching and learning. And this includes improving the early grades of elementary school, it includes bringing pre-K and kindergarten teachers together to work on transitions and to engage in joint professional learning. And it can also include collaboration among family child care providers or home visitors or early childhood centers. And this is the topic that we're gonna delve into today and I'll introduce our panelists in just a moment. The second strategy, next slide please. The second strategies these partnerships implement is to coordinate comprehensive services. And in our second webinar, we will we'll explore how schools and communities are better meeting the needs of young children and their families by organizing hubs of integrated services, connecting families to these services, and supporting trauma-informed practices. Laura Bornfreund of New America will moderate our second panel next week at this same time. And then in part through these comprehensive services, innovative school community partnerships significantly deepen their collaboration with families. Next slide, please. They go beyond random acts of family engagement by elevating family voice, creating new structures for meaningful input and participation, and by connecting to families early through school connected play and learn groups and home visiting, all of which are the topics of webinar number three. And Gracie Branch of the National Association of Elementary School Principals will moderate the third panel on December 3rd, the Thursday after Thanksgiving. And finally, it is critically important that these partnerships oversee the implementation of these strategies to ensure their success. Next slide, please. This involves creating leadership structures, developing focused plans, tailoring strategies to meet local needs, building the capacity to carry out these plans, and monitoring implementation and making mid-course adjustments based on impact. And it also involves growing the work to include more families and more communities which in turn requires not only support from school and community leaders, but state support as well. And Edward Manujak, the superintendent of Dundee Community Schools in Michigan, and the co-chair of the School Superintendent Association's Early Learning Cohort will moderate our fourth panel on December 10th. Next slide, please. I call this framework the first 10 theory of action, referring to the first 10 years of children's lives, and you can find a summary of it and other resources at first10.org. We're really looking forward to these conversations. And now I'd like to move to our topic today. Next slide, please. Collaborating to improve teaching and learning. And I'm very pleased to introduce our five panelists. Next slide, please. Nicole Beard is the principal of the Vivian Riddle Elementary School in Lansing, Michigan. Sue DeRisso is the director of literacy and title one at the Woonsocket Education Department in Rhode Island. Jason Sachs is the Executive Director of Early Childhood at the Boston Public Schools. Betty Underwood is the Project Director at rewarding uh, for the uh, Rewarding Educator Achievement and Performance Grant in Lansing, Michigan. And Mary Varr is the Executive Director of the Woonsocket Head Start Child Development Association. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, I have a number of questions uh, for the panelists to start us off. Uh, but as we go, I'll invite you to enter your questions for the panelists in the chat, and I'll pose them to the panelists towards the latter, of, uh, latter part of our session. We'll begin by having our panelists share an overview of their work on improving teaching and learning. And I'll start with First School in Lansing, Michigan. 
First School is a school improvement model developed at the University of North Carolina. And it was one of the first school improvement models to focus on the early grades, pre-K to third, while also placing great emphasis on racial equity. So I'm really pleased to begin with Betty and Nicole and Lansing's use of the first school model. Uh, Betty, could you describe first school for us and share how it's been implemented in the Lansing Public Schools? Sure, thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here today. First School is a collaborative model between public schools and university partnerships to improve the pre-K pre through third grade experience. Developed by Dr. Sharon Ritchie and her team at the University of North Carolina, the initiative originally focused on four schools in North Carolina and four schools in Michigan. This model builds the capacity of educators to address equity by questioning practices that impact children of color and those who come from less advantaged homes. Building on brain research with a focus on research-based instructional practices, the project is designed to foster classroom cultures of caring, competence, and excellence. Educators use new lenses to view and improve their practice. Through a process of collaborative inquiry, educators examine classroom observational data and reflect on areas of strength and areas of opportunity. The EdgeSnap tool, which identifies minute by minute experiences of students in the classroom is used to collect that data. It focuses on activity settings, child engagement and teaching and learning approaches. Childhood matters, we know, minutes count. We know that very small changes can make a big difference. A change of just 3% of time with spent on a focus on literacy can equal to 12 minutes a day 60 minutes a week or 5.5 days a year. That's important. By arming themselves with research and data, teachers advocate for effective practice for their students. This supports an approach to early school experiences for children that make a place, make school a place where they find themselves smart and capable and knowing that they belong. First School provided a framework for the I Collaborate project in Lansing. Yvonne Kamal Kanul, who had worked with First School as the Michigan coordinator, came to the Lansing School District as superintendent in 2012. A district at that time that had a budget deficit, numerous schools in priority status, and a lack of coherence, vision, and direction. She restructured the district into grade span cohorts, pre-K 3, 4, 6, K 6, and 7, 12, based on child development with a focus on instruction and built in the first school model. In an effort to develop coherence and a common language across the district, the I Collaborate initiative, which is a name that was coined by the principals in the project was born. Through the lenses of caring, collaboration and excellence, trust was built. Teachers became engaged in reflection on their own learning. I was the director of that project and I had previously worked with the first school model and saw it, 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 born, it was born in Lansing as I collaborate. Each year, teachers are observed for a two to three hour time block in the fall by outside observers. We hire former teachers and principals using the EdgeSnap Pre-K-3 and Class 4 through 12 tools. Instructional process data from this non-evaluative observation is then shared at the individual level, grade and subject level, and school level during a professional learning day in December. Each school has a leadership team, a principal and two teachers that leads the review of the data. A common data protocol is used to look for strengths, opportunities, and then to develop action plans for each school. This is then used to guide school improvement and professional development within each school and within the district. Thank you so much, Betty. It's so interesting how Lansing's been able to embed these observational tools in the district's culture. And I really like this idea of using it to develop a common language. Uh, so uh, turning to you now, uh, Jason, the, the Boston Public Schools Early Childhood Department has developed what is widely regarded as an innovative pre-K to grade two curriculum that includes coaching and professional development to support its implementation in classrooms. Uh, this work began with a pre-k curriculum for four-year-olds that has demonstrated landmark results and now has been extended to second grade for members of our audience who may not be familiar with your department's work 
Could you provide an overview of the distinct developments of the curricula that you and your colleagues have developed? Sure, happy to. Um, so I think the, the long punchline to this is if you create a preschool curriculum and you don't think about kindergarten, first and second grade, uh, you're gonna lose some of the strong gains you make. Um, and so building an infrastructure within a public school district is really an important piece to this work. So imagine if you all as strong early childhood folks were sitting in a public school district and you wanted to design curriculum. And so our team set about to think about how to do this curriculum. And I'd like to tell you that we did it pre-K to second, but we didn't really. We designed kindergarten, then we designed first and second, then we went back and we're redoing kindergarten, and we also revised the preschool. So this has been an iterative uh, process, and our goal is to submit to Ed Reports the curriculum by April so that it's actually one coherent picture, because these things sound very smooth, but they're, they're often very rocky. Um, underlying our curriculum uh, is that there, it's a thematic uh, literacy curriculum. And then what we do is we do social sciences, our social studies and science every other unit they become to the foreground and the background to kind of organize the themes. Underneath it are um, usually four to six core texts uh, that are studying a subject. Um, and then we do a lot of explicit vocabulary, phonics, small literacy group. Math is taught separately, although I'd love to think about doing more professional learning around integrating mathematics, but it's a separate uh, designated time. Um, and so that, that's sort of the, the structure of the curriculum. Underlying it are instructional practices that we believe make a difference for young children. So we continue to have center time. When they get older, we call them studios um, because that, that seems to work better selling first and second. Um, again, we have explicit vocabulary. Uh, we have a process called thinking and feedback, which is when children are in the centers, the teacher has a process for uh, having the child um, think uh, share what they've learned and let the kids give them feedback on that. And then that becomes part of the distributed knowledge. We do storytelling, story acting, which is Vivian Paley's work. And we do other sort of Reggio inspired observation thematic work with culminating projects. So for example, in kindergarten, uh, the kids are studying what would make uh, Boston a more fair and interesting place to live um, for all its citizens. And so kids come up with things like hospitals uh, for homeless, uh, restaurants for homeless folks, uh, beach cleaners, like all sorts of interesting thematic projects and how to make the city a more interesting place. And it's also building citizens. Um, you can find our curriculum. It's, we have a website, bpsearlylearning.org. Uh, and on there is the entire curriculum pre-K to second. And so it's free and you can have access to it. Along with it is coaching and professional development that happens uh, that really is the underguarding of it and design and really affects sort of all our policies because the coaches um, are probably 80% of our staff. And so what goes on in the classroom then guides our work. Uh, the other thing about our curriculum uh, is we do summer school now um, and we now have remote because of COVID. We've, we've gone into uh, remote teaching guides. So um, we can share that with you all. I think um, the other thing is just like we focus on curriculum instruction, professional learning, but there's also been NAEYC accreditation we've used to develop relationship with principals. And then we do a lot of uh, policy changes across the school district to help support young children. Um, and I'm happy to talk about those things. And then later on, the next question is going to be our work in community-based programs. So I'll, I'll get to that later. So I think that's a good enough. That's great. That's great. Thank you, Jason. Um, one thing that I like to highlight about the Boston Public Schools work in early childhood and particularly in pre-K and K is that um, they've really demonstrated the feasibility of a standards aligned developmentally appropriate curriculum. And that's a challenge that I see many communities wanting to address. Uh, yeah, the, one, the one thing I forgot to say, sorry, is that we also rewrote the curriculum to focus on culturally and linguistically sustaining practices and UDL, which is really to think about inclusion. Those are two places we did not start, but then we ended up. So I just forgot to say that. Great, great. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so now we'll shift a bit and turn our attention to how schools and early childhood programs can collaborate to set children up for success. And uh, my colleagues and I have been involved in Rhode Island's, Rhode Island's transitions work. So here I'm drawing on some inside knowledge as I ask these questions. So Sue, let's begin with how your transition to kindergarten partnership in Woonsocket came to be. 
Uh, often we think that having a history of collaboration in a community is an important indicator of community readiness. But in Woonsocket, I understand that your previous collaboration was spotty. Uh, so for the audience, how did your partnership start and how has it developed over time? Hi, David. I'd like to uh, start by talking about that bumpy start because uh, we had tried on several occasions to forge a relationship with not just Head Start, but other pre-K community-based organizations. And um, to say it was unsuccessful is, is minimizing that. Um, in fact, it was quick. we were quick to find that Head Start um, often came to the table with us. Other um, community organiz organizations did not. Um, and yet, even when we did come together, there were many differing opinions, especially about expectations. Um, so we happened to separately decide to participate in the Department of Education um, from Rhode Island, their summit to transition to K from pre-K. And the first summit, we sat at separate tables, had no idea that Woonsocket Head Start was in the same room with the Woonsocket Education Department. And it was David who noticed that and said, aren't you folks in this together? Aren't you both from Woonsocket? How about if you sit together? <laughs> and that's where our partnership began. Um, and we immediately started talking about some of the things that Woonsocket was well known for. And they're not things that we're proud of, but they're things that gave us a common bond. And, and, and some of those things are the fact that we are known for some of the highest instances of childhood neglect and abuse, homelessness, incarcerated parents, and obviously poverty, which seems to accompany many of those things. And so we decided we didn't wanna be known for those things. And could we forge a relationship that could give us an opportunity to work towards a positive outcome and be recognized for some wonderful things that we could offer our community. And so um, this team of individuals from, from, from both um, the Woonsocket Education Department and the Woonsocket Depart uh, School Department became known as the Wedheads. And we developed a relationship where we actually went out to, to look for community partners that wanted to join us. Mary Barr, who's also on the panel, she and I actually went and knocked on every door of every community pre-K partner there was in Woonsocket to invite them to be a part of our relationship. We also hosted community events to bring people into our library, give kids library cards, get, give them a whole lot of knowledge about what to expect in pre-K. We talked about social emotional concerns and brought in people to help support our families with that information. We created welcome to kindergarten videos and we presented all types of information and flyers and as well as pushed out um, community event information. Um, that was just the tiny seed of what we did. It was the beginning of our relationship because ultimately our relationship exploded when Dr. Bergeron at the office of Head Start um, nationally um, recognized us and invited us to be um, one of 12 districts across the United States to participate in a demonstration project that took that tiny seed and blew it up into something we couldn't imagine for our partnership. And I'm gonna let Mary Var um, detail just how much we accomplished together. But just so you know, it was this partnership of trust and understanding and the de development of really common goals, which wasn't easy to do, um, forged the relationship that we continue to have today. We lean on each other. Um, we have become more than just partners. I would say we've become friends because we have a common goal of supporting our youngest, most neediest learners. Thank you, Sue. Um, in, in, in my experience, it, it isn't all uh, at all unusual that school district and early childhood leaders might, you know, attend a state conference and not know each other. And I think it's inspiring for other communities that Woonsocket has gone from sitting at two adjacent tables uh, to a partnership that's doing such substantive work. And as you said, Mary will share more about what that substantive work is in a moment. So uh, Nicole, back to Lansing. Um, from your perspective as a principal, how has your school used the observational data from the first school EduSnap tool to improve teaching and learning? And what changes in classroom practice have you seen in your building? 
Thanks for allowing me to speak on this. So the overall drive for me as an administrator is to mitigate all circumstances as best as I can that would um, hinder children from learning and reaching their best potential. So we have found that our tool that we are using not only helps academically, but it also helps our culture and climate. And I'll share that, what, what I mean by that. So we get our results, we do the testing, I mean, the um, observations, and then when, when, get, when we get our results, we meet as a team and we do some analysis. From there, from there, we look at that, compare it with last year's. Have we grown? Are we growing? Did the things that we tried or said we were going to do last year work? If not, we need to fix this. From there, we make a plan. Um, I have an instructional mentor that I really utilize that works with the teachers. And they can set up additional meetings where the teachers can collaborate in grade levels and say, okay, this is how I used to teach this, this topic, or this is how I used to approach it. I'm gonna try something a little different here. So as an example, our oral language and collaboration comparison data from 18 to 19 um, shows that we were doing something. It was pretty low. Uh, so we began to try to be more intentional about how we teach oral language and improve collaboration activities. And we would do things like um, keep a little log of, of what we're working on or how many times we allowed student voice to be incorporated into the instructional practices. Um, again, the teachers would come back together and share um, how it went. We adjusted our lessons and from our 18, our 18, 19 data, it shows that there's an increase in school-wide student voice and providing intentional opportunities for students to talk about the content, not just to talk during snack time, but to talk about the content. And we're very proud of that. So we just wanna to continue to grow and, and learn from that. So if a child is allowed to share their voice regarding content, we felt, okay, we need to have the students share their opinions about other things regarding our culture and our climate. So we began to do surveys. We began to ask them about certain topics that we're teaching, um, certain things that they would like to have in the school. Mm. Um, COVID is, you know, that coronavirus, it did put a, put a little bit of a halt to it. But I think we've, we've gained so much ground that when we are able to uh, certainly face to face, but there's some things we can do online as well. Oh, thank you, Nicole. Um, I love that example and how you use the oral language and collaboration data and, um, and ended up uh, getting gains in student voice and you were able to see those in your data. Um, so that's, uh, that's exciting. Um, the, so Mary, uh, turning back to you, uh, uh, we'd love to hear more detail about some of the work that your transition team in Woonsocket has carried out. What are some of the strategies that you've implemented? Sure, <clears throat> I, I, I think it's important to just to, uh, kind of go back to what, what Sue had said and um, about differences. We spent a lot of time meeting together and realized that we didn't talk the same language. Um, so to, to Jason's point about the curriculum for preschool, you have to think about kindergarten first. Um, we, we came to the realization that we spoke talked about the same thing, but in a very different way. So, so once we got through that hurdle and, and worked on it together and, and found out we really were on the same page, we started to identify the areas of where we needed to work better on. Um, and one of those was, you know, talking about transition forms. We were always sending the school department transition forms on, on the children and, and their outcomes and everything. And they actually never got to the teachers. Um, or if they did get to the teachers, they weren't helpful. The teachers didn't understand what it meant. So we worked hard on that and changing that and um, pulling in the kindergarten teachers and saying, what is the information that you need to have? What do you want to have? And um, so we were able to do that. And then we shared that transition so that it's used by the other centers in the city. So now it's, it's cohesive. They're getting it from the early childhood centers into the teacher's hands of uh, meaningful information on the children that were in their programs. So we, we talked about that. Um, we got through that. One of the biggest things that, um, so the framework we followed was from the National Center 
um, <clears throat> on early childhood development and uh, talking about the child school connections, the family school connections, the program school connections, the community school connections. So we have this framework and we worked on different areas of that, which is why when Sue was talking about that we you know, knocked on these child care center doors and, and delivered a personal invitation to come be a part of it, um, to be a part of a community of that. That, that we wanted to do. We wanted our, our families, we got the library involved and we had our transition to K events at the library. So that, so that everybody in the city, it was, these are all of our children and we're going to help them succeed throughout each piece of this as, as we move along. The biggest thing that came out of our transition work um, was the fact that we realized we have so many children that are on IEPs in the preschool years and we, the school had been unable to service all those children except in self-contained classrooms. So we worked on getting those children spread out throughout our classrooms so that they were in a classroom with their peers throughout their early for three-year-old, four-year-old before they went to kindergarten. And so they did not have to be in a self-contained classroom. And um, our goal was to reduce the number of children on IEPs in kindergarten uh, significantly, which we definitely did and surpassed. Um, so that created an opportunity for us to work closer with the school system as well. Another benefit where we use the itinerant model for special ed and their special ed teachers are in our classrooms. They have office space in our buildings and they're, they're like our staff. So they are in there, they don't pull the children out of the rooms, they go into the rooms to provide the services to the kids. So we've really expanded just our little group, the, the other centers in the city, and then um, just the other staff in the school department getting to know our early childhood staff. And that's been um, one, of, one of the biggest things for us to do is that if most of our parents don't even know we're not the Woonsocket Education Department. They think that we're all one, one cohesive uh, agency. So, which is helpful for us. We talk about COVID, when COVID happened and the lockdown happened, we immediately called up our school department friends and said, can you share your virtual learning plan? We wanna follow the same thing that you're doing so that our parents, when they do get back their kids into kindergarten, next year, they're gonna understand the technology that you are using. We wanna use the same thing and get them ready for it. So it, it's given us so many opportunities to provide smoother transitions in, in all areas for our families. Thank you, Mary. So again, um, from you know two separate tables at a state conference to collaboration on inclusion classrooms, collaboration on the itinerant model and collaboration on your virtual learning uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so exciting, exciting work. Um, uh, Mary mentioned the four types of connections uh, in, the, uh, in the documents published by the National Center for Early Childhood Development, Teaching and Learning. Narmada, if you wouldn't mind showing the next slide. Uh, there are two resources from the National Center that we have found very helpful in our transitions work that I thought I would share. And I think of these two documents as anchor documents for transition planning, and I, I thought I would share them with you. Uh, New America uh, will make these slides available for those of you who are interested, um, but these are useful, as I say, uh, uh, anchor documents to help kind of guide this work. Thank you, Narmada. Uh, you can uh, stop this one. Yeah, thank you. So a quick follow-up for Sue. From the district perspective, what are the benefits of Head Start doing this work? And what do your district colleagues think of the partnership with early childhood providers more generally? Well, as Mary had alluded to the fact that we're never seen as a separate entity anymore. We become such partners that you don't know whose staff is whose. The fact that Mary has classrooms in our public school now, um, parents can't tell the difference between a Head Start classroom and one of our public school classrooms. And, and the same goes true with our employees that are in her centers. You can't tell who is a Woonsocket teacher employee or um, one of her staff members. Um, we've le learned a lot to lean on through leaning on each other. 
you know, as Mary mentioned to you, um, yes, we benefited immensely from having her provide more opportunities for kids that currently previously wouldn't have had um, preschool opportunities. But in addition, when the pandemic hit and we were able to say, hey, here's what we can do to you, do for you. Let us train you on distance learning. Let us show you our platforms. Let us show you our strategies. Let us um, show you how little learners can learn electronically. Um, so it, we just kept finding an, an ebb and flow. So they are welcomed part of our community. And if I were to say one way that our partnership was most recognized was that our governor in her state of state address actually recognized our partnership after having come to visit one of Mary's centers and our team. And she recognized us for our efforts because 50 children in Woonsocket, a very needy community, um, had opportunities to attend pre-K last year that would not have had that opportunity had it not been for the relationship that we forged. Hey, uh, thank you, Sue. Uh, no, that's a great example. I did not I, uh, think to be called out by the governor like that um, is, a, is, a, is a nice touch. Um, Jason, uh, turning to you uh, along the same lines, your department has shared its pre-K curriculum with community-based preschools for many years. Uh, you have a lot of experience with this uh, while also providing coaching and professional development. Uh, could you share with us the rationale for this collaboration, how you've gone about it, and what you've learned from doing it? Sure. So um, we have about a quarter of our preschool now uh, for four-year-olds is in community-based programs. Um, and what we did is uh, we knew that the staff would have bachelor's. We basically required staff to have bachelor's degrees. Uh, we'll pay them the same starting salary as a Boston public school teacher um, there to uh, use our curriculum um, and receive coaching and professional learning. Uh, we've created a new thing called an equity fund, which is programs can apply for comprehensive service funding above and beyond what uh, we've given them. We've also given them money for family uh, outreach coordinators and other comprehensive supports. Um, and we're now doing a pilot, um, really trying to figure out how to do um, special education services or serving students with disabilities in community-based programs to expand um, inclusion. Um, I would say that it's been a, 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 a long growing process. We started with a pilot, then we had the preschool expansion grant. And then when the preschool expansion grant left, uh, the city basically kicked in trust fund money. So this is all city funded to, to pay for these universal preschool um, slots. And, and the argument was, A, we destabilized uh, community-based programs when the public schools just said, hey, we're offering free preschool. Um, and then B, um, we found that certain families really need a 12 month of the year, eight hour, eight to 10 hour service. And so the community-based programs were offering something the public schools just simply can't do. We also got um, really, uh, we ran out of room in the public schools. So I think that this has sort of forced a, a, a good collaboration. I would say that, um, you know, we've been uh, successful with the curriculum, the coaching, when a couple of things are aligned. Um, so one is uh, the, the community-based program uh, has to be invested in actually uh, in implementing the curriculum. And often we found that like, that might be fine for a teacher, but if the director is not supported or if the director and the executive director of the agency are not aligned. So we've done a lot of work. We have uh, monthly meetings with executive directors and directors separately. And then um, obviously we do classroom coaching. So those structures need to be aligned. I think we've also found um, that there's still, even when you, you provide salary money, um, there's still a fair amount of turnover. So we've really started focusing more on directors so that when that teacher leaves, the director has the knowledge and also just building director capacity in general, uh, similar to principals, you know, early childhood, um, you know, observation and feedback, thinking about the curriculum, look for supports, those are all huge. Um, I think another thing in community-based programs that's been a challenge and an opportunity is there's no planning time in uh, community-based programs. And so building an agreement with community-based programs for coaching and planning time is a huge uh, structure that needs to be thought through better. Um, and then, you know, we really have had to differentiate our supports program by programs. The Head Start has its own system, but most community-based programs are small agencies and they don't necessarily have all the support. So really differentiating that partnership uh, has been a growing place for us. And I would say, you know, where we're gonna grow more is with director supports um, to create the kind of space for instruction to be focused. The other thing, lastly, 
is community-based programs were doing a lot less math instruction uh, than the public schools. So really thinking more clearly about, you know, what does mathematics instruction look like um, and what the professional learning needs to be and then the support in that area. I'd say those are some highlights, but there's plenty more. Yeah, no, it's clear that you've got a lot of experience this uh, doing this. And I know that other, other districts considering uh, uh, working closely, you know, with community-based programs can, you know, learn from that trajectory that you just described. And I, I also know there was a lot of interest when, when you mentioned that it's the same starting salary. So um, I'm sure we'll have some uh, follow-up questions there. Um, uh, so uh, Betty, um, Nicole mentioned that some of the changes that she, uh, she mentioned, some of the changes that she's seen in her school could you talk about some of what you've learned from Lansing's use of observational data district-wide? Absolutely, David, we, we've learned a lot. Um, we, um, the analysis of the data at the school and the district levels has given us the opportunity to look at our instructional policies and practices, you know, such as um, inappropriate transitions, arbitrary rules, behavior systems, and actually the way we did deliver instruction. It's guided our professional development at the school and at the, both the school and the district level. Um, through using the EduSnap tool over the past seven years, we found a significant increase in two predictors of success across the district. Um, as Nicole mentioned, oral language and scaffolded instruction, um, which combined together um, provide um, student voice. Um, Oral language has increased 3% or 12 minutes a day or six days a year um, over the course of the entire district since we began the project. Um, scaffolded instruction and versus di um, direct instruction where students are reacting and teachers are working with students has increased by 9% or 16.2 day more days per year. And we're excited about that. And we know that when teachers are talking, children are not. And as we move from a culture of silence um, to more talk, this develops the identity and supports cognitive development of students and increases relationships between teachers and students. And kids are actually more motivated. And it's led us to ask, how do we ensure that all students in every Lansing classroom have equal opportunities to a language rich environment where voice and thinking are valued. So we've made a focus on that. Um, two years ago, we began focusing our efforts on student voice. And um, we know that change is an, change, changes in intentional practices cause students in the majority of our schools to get closer to the goal of them doing the talking for at least half of the time. Nicole's school and several others experience that experienced this almost doubled the amount of student voice between 2018 observations and 2019 observations. And we celebrate these. Um, we share these kinds of things with our central administrators. We share them with other principals, with other teachers, and we, we collaborate together. Um, we know that this is key to the equity and closing the opportunity gap for all kids. So if all kids have access to high quality instruction, we really can close the achievement gap. So through looking at our data, we found areas to connect teachers so they can support each other. And I wanna go back to the, the pre-K kindergarten teachers. As we know, there is a huge disparity as we've all talked about this right here in this webinar, um, in the way that activities are structured. We found, you know, whole group, small group, the way that content is delivered and how much choice and collaboration is happening. There's a big difference. And our pre-K and K teachers work together and learn from each other. Um, we've also made connections with our Marzano evaluation tool we connect conditions of learning and the concepts of student voice. While the iCollaborate data and the tool is non-evaluative and the Marzano tool is evaluative, they do map onto each other, the elements that are evaluated and gives the teacher a method for um, self-reflection and a way to improve. I really believe that we have truly built a culture of mutual respect and collaboration and trust in our district. Um, we took the focus off the analysis of achievement data 
and we concentrate now more on reflection on the instructional process data. Mm -hmm. uh, teachers have taken control of their own professional learning and they really display a confidence to explore new challenges. This is very evident now as we are in a total screen to screen environment and have been since the beginning of the year. Um, principals and coaches have shared that teachers are collaborating together on how to improve their instructional pra practices in that Google Classroom or in, and in a remote setting. Thank you, Betty. So interesting that some of your schools uh, have doubled the amount of student voice. Really impressive. And one of those was Nicole's. So a quick follow up for you, Nicole. Um, what are some of the challenges of using observational data to improve teaching and learning? And I'm wondering if you have advice for other instructional leaders, other principals on how to overcome these challenges. I think the two areas that were posing a challenge for us would be funding and the ability to do the observation more than once a year. Mm -hmm. um, and the second issue would be just getting your team to be on board with it and find value in this process because some of them will say, well, we're only doing it once a year. What's that going to teach us? It's going to teach us a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, we may not have a uh, beginning of year, end of year, but we can go year to year analysis. Mm -hmm. And just the whole process of looking at the data and working together and collaborating, I can't stress enough how much that just tightens up your core of, in, of your instructional team. Mm -hmm. So that would, that would, my advice would be, uh, and if you're invested in the process, um, give your teachers space and time to get out of their comfort zone and be patient with them because there's trust involved. There's data there. And when people see numbers that they don't like, they tend to internalize it, but just remind them this is our school data. This is not a reflection on one person. And we're going to, if we do this right, we can use this to build in other parts of our school. Oh, great advice. Great advice, uh, Nicole. Thank you. Um, Mary and Sue, uh, I understand your collaboration has continued uh, throughout the pandemic and that in some respects the work is deepening. Uh, could you share how your partnership has responded to the pandemic? Sure. Well, we, um, we were fortunate enough to get um, Head Start funding over the summer to run a uh, program for children um, kind of like a ramp up program, which is something Sue and I have been talking about a couple of years um, for those children because they had been isolated for so long and we didn't want them to have six months before they went into a kindergarten classroom. So that was one of the pieces that we were able to do. And at the time, um, it, it was interesting because the school's not in session, but we worked with um, providing services virtually in the classroom, the IEP services. So that was a good test run for what was gonna happen as we got into fall and um, whether we did virtual or hybrid or, or whatever um, to see if, if that worked. So, so that was one of, the, uh, one of the positive things to come out of this pandemic. An another thing that we've done is we've been had on our, our list to do uh, professional development, to share professional development. We were fortunate in Rhode Island that um, the preschools were able to access uh, training and professional development and conscious discipline. We also, as an agency, um, had got some of our staff trained in it so that we could do it. And we purchased um, the online, the virtual training. So we actually had our first joint virtual professional development and conscious discipline uh, last month, which was fabulous. And, and what I had learned previously before we did that was that the school department had also been providing uh, conscious discipline, professional development for first and second, I believe it was. So now what we're trying to do again is the same message everywhere and that so we have the same language so that our children when they're three and four and five and six and seven they're hearing the same message from all of us um, we know that we have a, a very very high uh, rate of people with mental health uh, issues in in our city we have addiction and Sue had mentioned some of those before so conscious discipline is one of the ways that we felt we could come together and work together on helping those children improve their social emotional skills. 
So that was one of them. Another one that we've done, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of Circle of Security. We wrote some grants and we have some uh, school department staff that are going to be getting trained in being facilitators for Circle of Security, so small parenting group support. And we have other um, community agencies in the city that have already been trained in that and had already prior to the pandemic been holding a circle of security sessions. So the goal is really to get the whole community involved in that we're, we're one message and we're, we're one big support system that, that we can do this together. And I think that we've made a great start with our work with, with Woonsocket Education Department. I love hearing about the pre-KK collaboration around conscious discipline and the community-wide collaboration around circles of uh, security. Mm. So we've got a number of questions uh, queued up from our audience. Uh, last one for me, and this is for Jason. So, uh, so Jason, I know that Boston is participating in a major study of the efficacy of your pre-K to second grade curriculum. I'm wondering what you've learned from any early evidence you have to date, including what your teachers, coaches, and principals are seeing in classrooms. Sure. Um, so yes, uh, we are learning that when a curriculum is aligned and strong instructional practices happen, um, much, not much, but some of the fade out uh, disappears, meaning that kids do better when you have an aligned uh, curriculum. I think that's sort of the big punchline through first grade. Um, we're also finding that when families um, use, one of the things we've divided up our thinking is constrained and unconstrained. Constrained skills, things that are like alphabet uh, knowledge, phonic, uh, phonics, sounds, things that, you know, you learn how to count and that's sort of it. Um, that's more the constrained skills. Unconstrained skills are things like deeper thinking, high, um, more cognitive demand where kids are making connections. And we're finding that when teachers and families uh, use more unconstrained activities, open-ended questions with their kids uh, and sustain the conversations, um, especially low-income kids, low-income families, uh, that kids do better academically. Um, and so those are sort of two things that, you know, from an early childhood standpoint, we support, but the data seem to be supporting. The other thing we're finding is that um, that uh, class as a tool um, is awesome because it focuses on instruction, but it's a, a fairly blunt instrument and that we need more specificity in what teachers are doing in the classroom. We've developed a fidelity tool um, by way that looks at the components of the curriculum and specifically the level of what the teacher is doing um, at a much more fine grained analysis. Our, our fidelity tool is something like 17 pages of observation and it takes a couple of or an hour of observation, but it's focused specifically on the, on the instrument, I mean, on the uh, curriculum implementation. Um, and so we're finding that when the curriculum is actually implemented well, then kids do better. So I think just having those tools are really important. Um, so those are some of the sort of the big findings. Um, and I would just say, you know, it has uh, been great. Our coaches do the um, fidelity tools, uh, fidelity observations. And we've also, um, they don't do their own classrooms, but they do one another's classrooms. So that's really helped us build sort of a common language around what our curriculum should look like. And then um, uh, just in general, just being able to like fine grain and get specific has been been a huge difference. So I would say um, do a longitudinal study. Uh, it's really important. Um, and the data are, are, I think, you know, they're getting published pretty widely. So that's that ought to tell the relevance for people afraid of, you know, publish and perish. Can you just study real school, real time? Um, I think the answer is yes, you should be doing these research partnerships in school districts if the school district uh, lets you do it. But I would say that's been, um, you know, another kind of big, big thing is like when, when most early childhood studies, they try and track kids throughout the district, you know, throughout like the state and there's too much spread and so it's mm -hmm. nice when a school district can actually study itself and learn. So um, I would say these partnerships are really important. Uh, I look forward mm -hmm. to seeing that data uh, continuing to come out, but um, uh, it's, it's exciting to hear about your progress and what you're seeing so far. Uh, so we've got a lot of questions. Our conversation has generated a lot of uh, good questions from our audience. Um, and uh, Nicole, I'm gonna start with you. And we have a question about who does the analysis of the data that you collect? And the answer may be Betty, but um, uh, but we're interested in you know who does that analysis and how's it presented to teachers? 
uh, you use graphs, you know, and is it to all the teachers in your school? Yes. So after the uh, observers come in and do the analysis, the initial analysis, and Betty, you can help me with this as well, because sometimes I don't always know who the people are. But right. once, once we get the data back, as a school, we come together and we, we look at the pieces. And sometimes we have people from our REAP department that will come and help us better analyze the data and to be thought partners with us. So it is a school-wide effort. And I'll let Betty talk a little bit more about the actual observation uh, team. Sure, right. sure. Um, we have, um, well, we have um, six um, observers that go into various classrooms and then they um, use the tool and that's a, that is a, um, a web-based tool. Um, and then that data is then, we have a coordinator um, and that coordinator then takes and cr the graphs are created. We work with staff um, through um, Edge of Snap and we create graphs and then each individual teacher is emailed their own particular data um, the data is aggregated at the grade level and at the school level and at the district level. The school level is then shared with the, the schools um, at the first week, usually the first week in December, um, and then our professional learning day of that particular month is devoted to working on the analysis of that data with a data protocol that we've developed. And we develop, um, we develop a, a kind of a, a customized PowerPoint for schools to use with um, basic ideas that, that address the um, elements of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you both, uh, Nicole and, and Betty. Um, and we have a question for uh, maybe, I think, may, I think this is for Mary and Sue and it's, are school system teachers and Head Start teachers paid the same? And are Head Start funded children and school system children in the same classrooms? I'll turn it, I'll turn it over to you. Well, I'll start with the, the, the payment and then Mary, you can talk about how the classrooms are comprised, but no, we have a different teaching contract. In fact, when we first met, we had lots of program implementation problems because our teachers were on work to rule. So all of the work that we wanted to do, um, Mary and I and the rest of our team really had to, uh, to be done very carefully and because we, we couldn't get teachers to participate in that. Um, so no, that, that piece is, is, is different. Mary, you wanna weigh in about the classroom? Mm -hmm. The children, the children in the classroom. Sure. Um, yeah, I, and I do want to say that no, our, our teaching staff do not get paid what, what public school teachers get paid. That's one of the inequities of the early childhood field that we have to keep working on um, always. And, um, but so our classrooms have children that are, that the school department has identified with IEPs. So the, one of the really cool of, things about our partnership that, that we have is that we've created agreements with our families and, and, and the school and, and our agency so that when we get information about a child enrolling in one of our programs, we can share that information right away with the school. And if they have someone that is um, interested in, in enrolling for one of their preschool classrooms, they can share it with us. So we know right away what children are, are on IEPs and where they live in the city and where the best place to place them. So there, so the school department staff that are in, in charge of this department sit down with my staff and they help place the children together on where they need to go. And that has just been just mm. fabulous. So they know where their children are from, you know, before they walk in our doors and um, it's the same, the same for us. So, so they're shared, um, they get their service, the children that are on IEPs are in our classrooms. Mm. Um, really, really nice example. Um, Jason, next question is for you and it's, how do you keep uh, cultural and racial relevance at the forefront of uh, child-centered teaching within your curriculum? Um, so I think I also typed in the answer to that, but um, I think that it starts with the staff that you hire. Um, if you look at our staff, we have very diverse staff um, and we 
uh, go through uh, CLSP, tra CLSP training ourselves. Uh, it's been a jury journey. It has not always been easy. Um, so that's part of it is who your staff are and then how we um, function as staff, how our staff meetings are run, uh, how voices are heard, uh, processes and protocols to make sure that um, we are equitable. Um, so that's part of it, we sort of try and walk the talk. Um, so that's part of it. I think the, the uh, district has done a lot of work with is our Office of Achievement Cap around uh, using an equity tool. Um, so it really kind of looks at um, who's affected, who are the stakeholders, where are resources going. So there's a whole process around that. Uh, we used uh, seven forms of bias, which is a way of looking at your literature. Um, so it looks for forms of bias in your literature. So we've done that training. Um, so those, those are just three examples. Um, and then I think fourth, uh, right now with our benchmarks, we are going to focus specifically, for example, on, you know, um, you know, MCAS by fourth grade scores specifically for African American, African American and Latinx students so that we're actually, um, subgroup is just such a horrible term, but some kind of, uh, targeted kids we worry the most about. Um, and make sure that the data are driving an improvement. I think the district also has, um, uh, uh, it's called the CryOp tool. It's a tool for looking at in, uh, bias within the school. Um, so, you know, it sounds like with some of this first school stuff, they're looking at do kids have a voice, but also what are teachers doing? So I think, you know, getting kind of layering that in and certainly in the longitudinal study, we'd like to do more looking at bias. And then as a, di as a department, we constantly are trying to look at institutional bias and what, um, programs and policies support institutional bias. So I think you have to do it at every layer, level and every layer of your work, including the work you do with your staff. Um, so I guess that's that would be my short answer. Yeah, really um, uh, helpful. I think the way that you laid it out uh, at every le le level, just like you said. So really interesting. Um, the we have some, we have a question that I think could be for a couple of you and it's um, any, I think there's, there, there are questions around pay, again, another question around pay equity and Mary, you address that. Um, but do these stymie your collaboration either, you know, either in Woonsocket or in Rhode Island, I'm wondering if the pay equity issues have been a problem for your collaboration. I guess in Boston, you've managed to address that at least with your, uh, by paying the lead teachers in the community-based preschools uh, more, fun more funding. And I, and I think there's a question, Jason, in terms of where does that, where does that funding come from? So uh, first it's directors also can get a pay bump because you, if your director is getting paid less than a teacher and the assistant teachers as well. So we allow the agencies uh, to set the salaries, but the teacher has to be uh, same starting salary. Uh, the funds come from the city. Um, again, at, once we rolled off of the preschool expansion grant, the mayor made a trust fund for about $15 million. And the idea is that we, as we grow, we spend trust fund money in year one, but then it becomes part of the general fund. So it's the school's district's money that it gets from the city. Mm -hmm. So that's how it is. And then we also build on state subsidies. So if a, if a program, for example, and these are raw numbers, so don't quote me on them, but has gets about $8,000 a year from a state subsidy, we will add an additional $8,000 on top of that to cover the salaries and the comprehensive services. In addition, we created this comprehensive service fund that now will be rolled into the school district um, budget. So it starts with kind of free, free, what's an open money in the trust fund, and then it becomes general funds. But again, this is a city investment built upon state state dollars. So your city really has to come up with the dollars. And again, we built it off of the preschool expansion grant, which was federal dollars. Uh, thank you, Jason, really helpful. Um, I And Mary, I wanted to turn to you and uh, any further thoughts about, you know, whether that's been an impediment to your collaboration, the difference in, in, in salaries? I, it hasn't been an impediment to our collaboration at all. Um, but do we lose Head Start or preschool teachers to public school systems in the state? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think that, um, I, I think it's all, for the most part, it's what the person is looking for and what kind of a, a 
type of agency they want to work in. Some people mm -hmm. are want to work more in a community-based setting than they would in a school system and other people that's what they're looking for. All of our teachers have the same degrees so it's unfortunate that there is this disparity um, but but that is what it is but we haven't had uh, really any issues with with that. It's probably because all the staff we hired know that we know each other <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but no it's been okay. And, and Mary and I have worked collaboratively to try and um, work with state agencies on legislation to inform um, pre-K um, education and try to get more legislation around some of these concerns that Mary's addressing. You, you know, there, there, there is an issue that we're underpaying mm -hmm. um, our pre-K employees and, and we need to have them valued and how do we go about making that happen and can, can we in fact um, work with legislators to support us in that area of need? So um, two things. Uh, one, there have been some questions about what the EduSnap tool was and I saw that Betty added to the chat. Um, so thank you, Betty. Uh, that's helpful. You can find the link there if, uh, if you're curious about that. And then Sue's just provided a good segue to our last, to a final question for the panelists, and this will just be open-ended. But uh, uh, given the work that you've done in the past years, what suggestions do you have for how state and federal agencies can support this work? Sue already uh, tipped her hat in that direction, but I'd be interested in um, other, other, your other, everyone's comments on what are the implications for state and federal work uh, agencies? I would like to see um, more of an investment in terms of getting voice from those that work at the school level. Mm -hmm. I would like to see some of the people at the school level to be at the table, so to speak, to help make these decisions. It's easy to look at a data sheet and crunch numbers, but these are living people that were in children that we're working with. So they need more input from, from us. Mm -hmm. Great. Others, other reflections? I'd say that our governors is very much behind us um, and, and supports, we have an organization called Right Start that is really based on her initiative to really foster positive relationships and building early childhood education connections, not only through transitions to pre-K to K, but to really foster um, everything from home daycare situations to um, the programs themselves. She, um, she made it a priority and I think it needs to be a priority nationwide. I, um, I would well, agree with too, I, I would agree. I think it, it's, it's, you have to be out there in um, organized groups and advocate and have your data, have your information and be able to share the right message with the different groups of people and um, to, to be able to make that change. But it's, it's everybody's, Everybody can play a piece of it from, from you know, the Chamber of Commerce to the Department of Ed to the Senate Finance Chair, like everybody. And we just have to get that word out to them, the importance of it, which, which I would hope that with the state of this pandemic, that that would be more obvious um, than it ever has been before. Thank you, Mary. Jason. Finding, I'm oh, sorry. Jason and then Betty. Uh, doesn't, Betty, you go first. I'll go after. No, I was going to say, I think, I think telling our story, getting mm -hmm. out just what, what Mary said and what Susan said and Nicole, uh, I think we need to get out there and tell our story of what we've done mm -hmm. and the, the impact it's had on our students. Thank you, Jason. So I, I would say that what I think we've been successful in part because we have really focused on um, instruction and student outcomes. And I think that the, um, the superintendent and the mayor, um, even though I've had six different superintendents and two different mayors, um, uh, they all, because it, there's data, they all understand what we're focused on and what we're trying to do. And I think the more you focus on students um, and outcomes, uh, the, the easier it is for people to fund it. And I would say it has been easier to get private funding and uh, federal and state funding. Um, with that said, you know, we've 
the city is funding this, right? So it took a leader in a mayor, it, if you'd waited for a Republican administration to fund early education programs, he'd still be waiting. Um, and the federal government clearly has been dry <laughs> for a while in early education. And so obviously with a new administration, there'll be possibilities, but uh, someone has to pay for this. Um, and we have to expect professionals to do the work. Therefore, we need degreed people to do this work. It's complicated, very hard work. Um, and we need people to, to stay and partner with public schools and have real commitments with public schools and community-based programs, equal respect, equal pay, equal infrastructure to make this work. Um, I have found that the public schools have a lot of resources and have a lot of desire to do this work but you know i've been there for 15 years right and we still haven't solved a lot of these problems so i just think we need more people to partner with the public schools in meaningful ways and the community-based programs should not be attacking the public schools nor should the public schools be attacking community-based programs um, and we all have to get better because a great opportunity here i mean you can do this well you will help close the achievement gap um, and therefore, if we if we need to do this well, and we need to create more tools to get it done. So that's my two cents. I want to thank all of our panelists today. It's been a really interesting uh, uh, conversation. I think you you shared um, really val valuable lessons that I know our audience appreciated. So thank you to you. I want to thank our audience. I want to thank uh, New America for uh, their support and all of our uh, partners. And uh, Narmada, if you would show our last slide, I invite you all to um, uh, next week, our second uh, webinar on coordinating comprehensive services. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you at our future uh, webinars. Thank you all so much.